In 1983, Yuji Horii, a young video game colonist in Weekly Shonen Jump, decided to enter a programming contest sponsored by a company named Enix. Under the leadership of its founder, Yasuhiro Fukushima, the company had recently shifted its focus from publishing tabloids to publishing games in the burgeoning computer market, despite him lacking any programming knowledge or employing any game designers. So instead, he held this contest for hobbyists in the hopes of recruiting young talent and publishing the winning games. With a prize of 1 million yen, it was a lucrative chance and after a relatively sizable marketing campaign, 300 entries were received. In the end, Hori's tennis game, Love Match Tennis, was well received enough to place among the 13 winning entries and have his game published. This both ignited a passion for game design and put him in contact with the contest's second prize winner, Koichi Nakamura, a programming prodigy who was only 19 at the time. Nakamura, often nicknamed Chun by his friends, would soon found the developer Chun Soft, and together with Hori acting as the scenario writer, created the Portopia serial murder case. Inspired by the rise of text adventures in America, Hori wanted to bring the genre to Japan. And while it did well enough on PC to warrant two sequels, it would find the most success on the Famicom. This, along with his and Nakamura's love for the RPG's wizardry and Ultima, inspired them to design an RPG of their own specifically for the Famicom. That RPG would become Dragon Quest. And by now, you likely know the story of this series, how it was so massively popular in Japan that one of the most prevalent urban legends in gaming took hold. The legend being that the government had outlawed weekday releases for the series to prevent kids and adults from skipping school and work respectively. It's a wild claim that's only actually half true. Yuji Horii and Enix saw the popularity of the franchise after the third game and asked Nintendo to move the release date to Saturday so kids wouldn't miss school. But that right there is a key point. Kids were playing these games. I cannot emphasize enough that RPGs were a hard sell to most gamers at the time. While they had become relatively popular on Japanese PCs thanks to the aforementioned wizardry and Ultima, they were also seen as games more for adults. They were often brutally difficult with a notepad always a necessity and players benefiting from at least some knowledge of Dungeons and Dragons. Simply put, early RPGs were viewed as too complex for a wide audience. The genre was also seen as a poor fit for the Famicom as action titles prevailed among its generally younger demographic. But the success of the Portopia serial murder cases port on the console showed Hori and Nakamura that there could be interest in these types of games. If they were going to succeed though, many of the hardcore aspects and statistical nature of the genre needed to be simplified. It also required a focal point. Hori realized that if players could associate themselves with the hero, especially in terms of a coming-of-age tale, that a connection would naturally grow. Using RPG mechanics to show a character's growth was a natural way to represent the idea. And what better way to do this than with the exploration and story of Ultima combined with the first-person battles of wizardry? Of course, the story of Dragon Quest, by modern standards, is incredibly simplistic. The player is cast as a young man descended from the legendary hero Erdrick, who in the past had saved the continent of Alephgard thanks to mystical items and a magical ball of light. While this light had been in the care of the royal family for ages and protected the land, an evil figure known as the Dragon Lord had invaded Tantagel Castle and stolen the artifact along with King Lorik's daughter, Gwalyn. Now monsters roam the land, terrorizing the people, and it's up to this new hero to save Alephgard. For my own part, Dragon Quest was always on the fringes of my knowledge. I didn't get into RPGs until Final Fantasy VII, but that set off a chain reaction of me trying to play every RPG I could get my hands on, especially if it was developed by Squaresoft. I'd hear about this Dragon Warrior series, but would never actually play the games. I was more fascinated by the urban legend and the constant annotations that Dragon Warrior was actually Dragon Quest in Japan. That naming difference was due to a pen and paper RPG from SPI also called Dragon Quest. Enix didn't want to bother spending the money to possibly challenge the copyright. It wasn't until Dragon Quest VIII that I gave the series a shot, but despite enjoying what I played, I got lost, got frustrated, and gave up. Instead, Dragon Quest IX would be the first game in the series I would beat and gave me an appreciation for what they did. Still, to this day, I've only ever beaten 9, 11, 8 on the 3DS, and the original. It's time I fix that. I may have more of an association with Final Fantasy, but I appreciate what Dragon Quest brings to the table. I simply need to play more of the mainline games, and that's what I intend to do, starting with the very first. 
The incredible thing is though, this game holds up remarkably well despite the bare bones nature of the adventure. There aren't any subplots or side quests or even party members. Equipment is limited and spells are learned automatically. It's all about exploration and becoming strong enough to defeat the Dragon Lord. It's simple and yet I think there's a reason it's one of the few Dragon Quest games I've beaten before. It's incredibly addictive. This is actually my third playthrough of the game as I've beaten it before on NES and mobile. So with that in mind, which version should I play for this Odyssey through the series? One of my major goals is to show the evolution of Dragon Quest, so I'll be attempting to play on original hardware as much as possible. The thing is though, the NES version is already a major update from the original Japanese release. In the Famicom version, there is no save option. Instead, players were given different passwords based on their progress. The sprites were also much more basic and, like an Ultima, everyone always faced forward and shifted around the map. This also meant that when talking to an NPC, players would have to choose a direction first so the game would know who they were trying to talk to. And remember, this was still simpler than many of the other RPGs of the time. Thankfully, things are a bit improved for the NES version, and that's what I played for this video. The game begins by asking the player for their hero's name. I typically like to go with canon names for my RPGs, but Dragon Quest rarely has them. However, I did discover that this hero was named Aleph in a Japanese drama CD and novelization, so I went with that. It also helped that it was a bit of a pun. The continent is Aleph Guard, my name is Aleph, I'm gonna guard the continent. Perfect. Aleph begins in King Lorik's throne room with him detailing the Orb of Light and the Dragon Lord before setting the young hero on the quest. There are chests scattered amongst the room as well as a few guards, which will help serve as a tutorial for the command menu. These consist of talk, spell, status, item, stairs, door, search, and take. The key thing to note is that many of the quality of life upgrades we're used to are not here. I can't go to a chest and push a button to automatically open it. I instead must select take. The same applies to talking, opening doors with keys, and using the stairs. Aleph must be placed on top of or next to them before selecting the option. It feels cumbersome at first, but I honestly got used to it pretty quickly. It helps that talk is the first option as that's what I use most while the others are typically a rarer occurrence. Inside the chest are 120 gold, a torch, and a key. The key is immediately used to open the door while the guards detail Princess Gwalen's capture six months ago, how to use keys, and that a town lies to the east of the castle where weapons and armor can be purchased along with an inn to rest. Likewise, the rest of Tantagel Castle's residents tell Aleph further tips like how the king saves your progress or general lore such as merchants being killed on the road by the Dragon Lord's monsters just to give him that extra menace. If there's one thing that Dragon Quest excels at though, it's setting goals. The player is told right away that the Dragon Lord is the cause of all things wrong in this world. Everything you do is in service of defeating him. And as soon as you exit Tantagel Castle, the Dragon Lord's castle, Charlock, can be seen across the water. The final destination is right within sight. You're just not going to go there yet. First things first, Aleph needs equipment. So it's off to the nearby town of Breconary, which sets the stage for most of the towns in the game. The people within typically offer advice or a small bit of storytelling. The tips generally warn you of things to come or where you should travel next. In this case, one person outright tells you that the town of Garenham is to the northwest, making it the only other place you actually know the location of. But I like this simple bit of exposition from a soldier who points out that Aleph is not the first to set out on this quest. Many have tried and all have failed. It's minuscule, but it does provide further motivation to be the first to succeed. Though if Aleph is going to do that, he's going to need equipment and the 120 gold from the king isn't much of a start. Breconary's equipment shop includes a bamboo pole, a club, a copper sword, clothes, leather armor, and a small shield. While the stats of these items aren't shown, the more expensive they are, the more powerful they'll be. Our hero has three equipment slots in total, one for his weapon, one for his armor, and one for his shield with no option to carry extra as they're not needed. Obviously with the amount of gold I have, there's no way I'm getting all three right away. So I opt for offense and pick up the club and decide against the clothes. Since I'm only 10 gold away from the leather armor, it's best to wait. That's because it's time to get into the real meat of Dragon Quest's gameplay, the grinding. This one aspect will solely decide whether you will want to bother with the game or not. As I said before, there's little else to dress up this adventure. 
It's all about fighting monsters, growing stronger, and venturing farther into the world. If you're willing to accept that, then I believe this is one of the purest and strangely satisfying examples of grinding I've ever encountered in an RPG. Make no mistake though, that the combat is as simple as it gets. It is always a one-on-one -on -one fight. The hero can attack, use magic, run from a fight, or use an item. However, magic is not even available until level 3, where the heal spell is earned, which essentially allows the player to fight for longer in the field before returning to an inn to rest. Where it becomes addictive and satisfying is how it sets goals. I only have a club and I know I need to travel to Garenham to the northwest, but I only have 15 HP and enemies can hit harder than you'd expect. Sure, I could attempt to run from each battle in order to reach the town, but then I'd still be too broke to buy better equipment or even effectively use the more expensive inn. So it's best that I grind around Breconary, use its cheap inn to recover, and buy all the best equipment before moving on. In the moment, I'm grinding, but I'm not thinking about the experience points or earning levels. I'm thinking about buying better equipment so I can see even more of this world. It's a hallmark of simple feedback loops that Dragon Quest almost manages to maintain throughout the entire adventure. Of course, this constant grind becomes much more tolerable when one of the best manga creators of all time handles the character and monster designs, while an anime composer created the music. The fact that both Akira Toriyama and Koichi Sugiyama were willing to work on this game, especially with Enix being such a young publisher, seems nothing short of miraculous. So how in the world did it actually happen? Well, when Enix first approached Shonen Jump about advertising their game design contest, they spoke with one of its editors, Kazuhiko Torishima. Torishima had been the one to push for video game content in the extra pages of the magazine as he was fond of gaming himself. A friend of his had introduced him to Yuji Hori, which is how Hori got the writing job in the first place. So when it came time to write about Enix's contest, Hori was the one Torishima put on the job. This is also what led Hori to enter himself, though anonymously. The relationship between the two continued after Hori began developing more games, as he both continued as a freelance writer and would provide Torishima with insider knowledge of the industry. As time went on, the popularity of the Famicom grew so much that a new magazine was created called Famicom Shinken, which offered news, cheats, tips, and reviews of Famicom games. This in turn became incredibly popular and many of Hori's articles were repurposed for the magazine. Ever looking for opportunities, Torishima jumped at the chance to be a part of Dragon Quest when Hori told him about the concept as he too was a fan of wizardry. He sensed that this game would be a hit, and with one of his own writers a part of it, it was a golden chance to not only get exclusive stories about the game, but perhaps even have Shonen Jump feature comics set in the game's universe. So he decided to mention that one of his biggest talents, Akira Toriyama, was interested in illustrating for a video game. After all, they could make it together. At this point in his career, Toriyama had already seen success with Dr. Slump and was well into painting Dragon Ball, with Dragon Quest releasing sometime in the middle of the Red Ribbon Army arc. That being said, fans of Toriyama would be the first to point out that the man didn't have much interest in video games. Torishima was likely straight up lying. Fortunately, the artist loved trying something new, and both Hori and Torishima were able to convince him to take the job. And it should be said that Toriyama did try the game after it was released and very much enjoyed it. But it cannot be understated how much personality Toriyama's designs bring to Dragon Quest. Hori would provide basic monster ideas to Toriyama, who would then redesign them himself and submit them for approval. One only has to look at Hori's version of a slime which took inspiration from Dungeons and & Dragons and compare it to the absolutely iconic design that Toriyama created and they translate remarkably well into battle. While there are only 15 different monster types in this first game, there are 40 in total thanks to multiple recolors. This may feel lazy to some, but I believe it offers a sense of progression in this case. Not only are you getting stronger, but the monsters are too, and some of the monster types don't appear until late game. The monsters and their designs are simply timeless, with all reappearing at some point in the series and becoming mainstays. I already mentioned slimes, but Dragon Quest introduced drakies, golems, chimeras, knights, and naturally dragons. Many of them were so cute that Hori decided to say that they were defeated in the text, not killed. However, the quirkiness of modern Dragon Quest names hadn't been established yet, so many of the names on NES don't quite match. Drakies were drakies, the gold golem was a gold man, and the chimera was a wyvern. 
but then there are the updated names that simply make me smile. The Druin on NES would become the Lunatic, a simple wolf would become the Werewolf, and the Werewolf would become the Terewolf. It's that extra charm that made me come to appreciate modern Dragon Quest. It's a shame that Toriyama wasn't more recognized in the West at the time. The Japanese box art is fantastic in conveying the adventure of the hero and the dragons he'll be facing. The instruction manual has just as much personality. Conversely, that uniqueness is lost in the American box art. It's essentially the same scene, but depicted in a more typical fantasy art style. Maybe it worked better at the time, but I'll always prefer Toriyama's artwork to the lanky knight featured in the American manual. So that's how Toriyama joined the project, but what of the composer, Koichi Sugiyama? Well, once again, the stars aligned. Enix would often include questionnaires along with their games to make sure their fans were satisfied. One such questionnaire had been returned to the offices from a copy of their Virtual Shogi, which had been developed by the grand prize winner of Enix's initial design contest, Kazuro Morita. It immediately caught the staff's eye as it was filled out by Sugiyama himself, though amusingly, it was not exactly a positive response on his part. The middle-aged composer had made a name for himself thanks to his work on The Sea Prince and The Fire Child and the Cyborg 009 movie. So naturally, Enix jumped at the chance to reach out to him and ask if he would be interested in composing for a video game. To their surprise, he agreed. His first video game soundtrack would be Wingman 2, a licensed game based on a manga running in Weekly Shonen Jump. It's a funny old world, isn't it? The next project he was asked to be on would be Dragon Quest. However, Nakamura was skeptical about how well a non-programmer could write video game music, especially given the limitations of the Famicom's sound chip. But Sugiyama was nothing if not dutiful and knew to take those limits into account when composing his tracks for the game. These songs would be sent as sheet music to the sound programmer, who would then implement them into the game. In total, he composed eight different songs, along with various jingles such as the Level Up theme. To have such pieces of classical music in a video game felt nothing short of revolutionary at the time. The Dragon Quest Overture is iconic and can be enjoyed in all its glory on the title screen. The rest of his tracks are just as well remembered and legendary in their own right amongst the fans. They're all still incredibly enjoyable, but I'd be lying if I said they didn't get repetitive after a while, especially the battle theme thanks to how much grinding is necessary. I enjoy them for as long as I can, but inevitably I zone out while listening to podcasts or other YouTube videos. I would personally recommend Clement's Final Fantasy series or Tekken Retrospective, any of Some Call Me Johnny's videos, the Golden Bolt's Ratchet and Clank Deep Dive series, and Bell Aim's first playthrough of a Dragon Quest game with Dragon Quest XI. There's nothing quite like seeing a newcomer learn to love the series. Of course, if you haven't watched all of Good Vibes Gaming's videos, they're a great choice too. With those two important elements established, it's time to return to Aleph, because while there's not much story, the quest he's on is quite good for the time. For as much time as grinding for levels and money takes up the playthrough, the game can be beaten in around 12 to 15 hours, and the pacing of those levels, at least early on, is solidly compelling. It only took about 30 minutes for Aleph to reach level 4, which netted him both the heal and hurt spells. As I stated before, these spells are earned at specific levels no matter what your hero's stats may be. But how are those stats determined? Well, it's all down to your name. Based on what you decide, two stats will be buffed in the long term, be it HP, MP, Strength, or Agility. And there are stat trackers out there if you want to be sure your hero focuses on the stats you want. That being said, I don't think it's necessary. You might be able to beat the game a level or two earlier, but despite Aleph's long-term strengths being Agility and MP, I finished the game just fine. I should note though that agility is somewhat different compared to most later RPGs. There is no turn order in Dragon Quest. The hero always attacks first, but agility will help determine his accuracy, slightly increase his defense, and how likely he can run from a battle. It's certainly the most versatile stat. On the way to Garenham, you'll likely discover stairs in the middle of a desert. This is the first dungeon. Kind of. It's more like a tutorial as no monsters will ever appear. The purpose of this location is to show players that torches are a necessity when underground, so it's good that King Lorik provided one at the start. 
That said, it's not amazingly helpful as it only illuminates a small square around the hero. But it's enough to fumble through the dungeon, learn the dungeons have multiple floors, and find a chest containing Erdrick's tablet. It's moments like these that convey Dragon Quest's story, such as it is. In a macro sense, the whole thing can be summed up in two sentences, but it's the moment-to-moment -moment discovery within each location that crafts a narrative. In this case, Aleph learns that there are three items needed to reach the Isle of Dragons. All of them have been entrusted to three descendants that must be found. Finding these descendants is the story, and Dragon Quest was unique at the time as most other RPGs conveyed their story through an omniscient voice, informing players of what they've done and where they need to go. In this game, that information is provided by the villagers of each town, helping players feel more like this is their journey. Garenham is a great example of this as villagers mention how Princess Gwalyn was hidden away in a cave to the east and how the town was founded by a legendary minstrel named Garen. Nothing can be done with these tips at the moment, but it does lead the player in the next direction they should go and plant the idea that this town is important when looking for descendants. There's just a door in the way for now. But as each village marks another time to grind in order to afford better equipment, bridges signify when those monsters will get stronger. The world is completely open, it's more a matter of surviving it. And there were times when I would push that idea. Rather than save up for everything, I'd try to reach the next town so I could buy the next better piece of equipment right away. But there was no way I could fight every monster while searching for that next town, even more so when the encounter rate is all over the place. There are moments when I can easily walk 10 to 20 steps without a single battle, and then others when I'm accosted every two steps. There's simply no consistency. That said, overall, I didn't find it to be too bad. It was at its worst when the monsters would wear me down, hitting harder than I was ready for or taking too long to escape from a fight. My resources would whittle down and I'd have to make the choice to either push forward in the hopes of finding the next town or retreating. But remember, Dragon Quest was developed with kids in mind. There are no game overs to be found. You don't return to the title screen and have to start where you last saved, however long ago that might have been. Instead, the hero is returned to King Lorik, who says that shouldn't have happened and half your gold is taken away. That is more of a time punishment as it can take a while to regain all that lost money, especially with how expensive the endgame items are. However, at the very least, I never had to worry about losing any of the experience I had earned. That is a godsend. Now keep in mind that I still saved often with King Lorik as he is the only save point in the entire game. If I knew I had to make a dangerous trek, I'd pay him a visit before making the attempt and restart if I failed. I wanted to hold on to that money, and returning to Tantagel Castle becomes less of a problem over time. Even as soon as the third village of Cole, there's a way to instantly go back to the castle thanks to the wings in the item shop. There's a lot of thought placed into every design decision within the game. Cole serves as a kind of crossroads town. It warns of the danger of the South Island, but also says that the town on that island, Remolder, is where keys are sold. There's also mention of another town to the east of a place called Hawksness, where fantastic weapons are sold. And then there's mention of a flute that's able to put a golem to sleep. All of this is fantastic information, but Cole might be remembered more for something else in Japan, as it's here, in every version except the NES, that the infamous Puff Puff Girl can be found. Puff Puff is actually a reference to Akira Toriyama, as he had used the onomatopoeia early in his Dragon Ball run. What does it refer to? Well, it's the act of a woman rubbing her breast in someone's face. Considering the girl who does it in Cole is near a bathhouse, the implications are pretty clear as the screen fades to black. And it's become a staple of the series, associated with it much more than Dragon Ball. Some games play the act straight, while many of the modern games play with what the Puff Puff actually comes from. But yes, here in the original game, our hero is paying to have breast rubbed in his face for no in-game benefit whatsoever. In the NES version, the girl simply states that the bath cures rheumatism. Returning to Aleph's quest, there's a second bridge that leads to an old man in a cave. He wants the silver harp in exchange for the Staff of Rain. Just something to be aware of as I prepare to head to the southern island. However, to get there, I need to cross a poisonous swamp and travel through a cave. It seems simple enough, but if you choose the wrong path, you'll come face to face with a green dragon and likely immediately die. Like I did. It's a lesson in not trying to rush through the adventure. The green dragon only appears in a specific spot, but even when I do make it to the south, I get pummeled for not being suitably equipped. 
It always takes some time, but it does feel rewarding to return to those places that gave me trouble and actually make my way through. With enough patience and preparation, I managed to make it to Remolder. Despite being the first turn-based RPG on the Famicom, Dragon Quest is remarkably clear in its directions. Not once did I ever need a guide to learn where to go or what to do. Everything is found within the game itself. However, I recommend keeping notes. With at least an hour or so of grinding between each town, it's easy to forget some of the clues from previous towns. And with Remolder, that becomes especially true as this is indeed where keys can be purchased, though only six can be held at a time. This wouldn't be a problem if not for the fact that doors return once Aleph leaves the screen. It was at that moment that I started taking notes, if only so I didn't have to travel all the way to Remolder and buy more keys so I could see important information again. The town provides some of the most solid clues on what Aleph needs to do to reach the Dragonlord. One man tells how Erdrick created a rainbow bridge on the western side of this island, while another mentions that the Stones of Sunlight are back in Tantagel Castle. More intriguing is the villager who mentions a magic temple to the south where the sun and rain meet. It becomes obvious that the Staff of Rain and the Stones of Sunlight are what's needed to make this rainbow bridge, so that's two of the three artifacts mentioned on Erdrick's tablet. There is another person who tells of a hidden passage in the Room of the Dragonlord, but that won't be necessary for quite some time. What I do want to highlight, though, is how quirky Dragon Quest attempts to be at times. Humor becomes more prevalent as the series goes on, but there are strange moments to be found in this first game. I've already mentioned the Puff Puff Girl, but Remolder has a random woman who insists she has no tomatoes, while two lovers can be found on the outskirts of town attempting to meet up and utterly failing. They're not amazingly funny or anything, but it's a signature of Hori's writing style as he tries to say a lot as concisely as possible and let the visuals tell the story, a lesson he learned from his time at Shonen Jump. He did like to sneak in the odd joke though, as was also evident from the Portopia serial murder case. With keys in hand, I begin returning to all the previous villages to both open their doors and learn more information. For example, I discovered in Remolder that the fairy flute needed to face the golem was south of Cole's Bath. After getting that, I returned to Tantagel Castle where I found another shop that sells keys, albeit at a higher price. And by crossing super damaging tiles, I learned that Garen's grave can be found by pushing on a wall of darkness. I was tripped up by one thing in the castle though. I knew that the Stones of Sunlight were somewhere in there, but I thought a specific tile had to be searched, much like the Fairy Flute. I figured a later town would tell me where to search, but that never happened. Instead, I eventually figured out that the Castle Cellar was hidden on the eastern outskirts. It can easily be the first artifact you find. In Breconary, the keys reveal that Garen's grave is where the Silver Harp is found, the item I need to trade for the Staff of Rain but there's also a woman who sells fairy water that keeps weaker enemies at bay. It's here that I learned of the item limit for Aleph. While some items stack up to six, like the keys and herbs, others, like the fairy water and wings, don't. This also applies to the key items like the sunstones and fairy flute. It could be a problem, except Dragon Quest smartly addresses this thanks to magic. At level 9, Aleph learned the Radiant spell, which outclasses torches outright thanks to its massive circle of light. It's what helped me realize that I needed to stick to the left side of the cave to avoid the green dragon. In the same vein, the hero will eventually learn Outside, which allows him to immediately escape a dungeon, Return, which sends him back to Tantagel Castle, and Repel, which keeps weak enemies away. These spells won't all be learned until level 15 though, helping to balance how much a player needs to spend on the item versions until the magic option is available. It's all a part of making players feel stronger and more capable. Why spend money when a better light is available at the palm of my hand? I found almost every spell to be useful, even the status effects. When I was fighting physically strong monsters, I discovered that the sleep spell would usually provide just enough of an edge to survive. Usually. Sometimes they were asleep for the rest of the battle, other times they woke up after a single turn. Arguably more useful was Stop Spell, which prevents enemies from casting magic including Hurt, Sleep, and Heal. Nipping that in the bud made my life way easier. The final two spells are Heal More and Hurt More. Heal More is a godsend by the end of the game, while Hurt More is useful in some instances, but more often than not, I wanted to conserve my MP for when healing was necessary. Still, I was surprised just how much I used every spell in the game. It's at this point that there's only a few more major steps left in the adventure. 
It's possible to find Garen's grave in Garenham, visit a two-floor dungeon to the southwest that's near the mountains, travel to the destroyed village of Hawksness, or finally attempt to save Princess Gwalyn. The only one not worth doing, at least on the NES, is that extra dungeon. The Fighter's Ring sounds great as it's supposed to increase Aleph's critical hit rate, except the programming error means it doesn't actually work. This is also the point where the best equipment available is almost a necessity. The monsters are just too strong wherever I turn, but thankfully Goldman can be found to the south of Remalder near the bridge. Although they barely reward any experience, they are the best source of gold in the game, making it the quickest way to buy the magic armor. The game never states it, but this armor is capable of restoring 1 HP every few steps, which is a lifesaver for dungeons at this point. It's helpful enough that I was even able to make my way through Garen's grave and retrieve the Silver Harp, quickly trading it for the Staff of Rain. It's here though that Dragon Quest's pacing hits a brick wall. I never needed to grind for more than an hour at a time between each of the previous villages, and there was always something to strive for in terms of equipment. That's not the case anymore. There's nothing to find in Hawksness, and I'm not strong enough to reach the final town, Cantlin. However, I am able to challenge the Green Dragon in the Eastern Cave. It's certainly tricky with how hard it hits, but I'm just strong enough to defeat it and rescue Princess Gwalyn. There's even a special sprite of the hero carrying her. Once she's returned to Tantagel Castle, King Lorik and all the rest of the villagers who previously talked of Gwalyn's capture celebrate her rescue. Plus, the princess is so impressed by his deeds that she has completely fallen in love with Aleph, even offering an item called Gwalyn's Love. This allows the player to check on the progress to the next level and states how far from Tantagel Castle they are. But with everything else done, all I can do is grind, and it takes over two hours to reach a high enough level to survive the trip to Cantlin. And that's despite finding the location of the Metal Slime in the southwest corner of the map. Sure, it offers plenty of experience, but with how hard it is to hit and how prone it is to running, I only ever managed to defeat four of them. It's not exactly the time saver that Goldman is. As I reach Cantlin, I'm confronted by the golem that I was warned of way back in Cole. Fortunately, I have the fairy flute that puts the monster to sleep and makes it a complete pushover, allowing me to enter the town. And inside are two of the best items in the game, the flame sword and the silver shield. Amazingly, despite all the grinding I had done, I still only had enough gold for one. They're just that expensive. Otherwise, the townspeople detail exactly where to find Erdrick's armor, as it used to belong to a man named Wynne. This Wynne buried it at the foot of a tree behind his shop in Hawksness, though before I head there, there's still one more important piece of information. After crossing more super damaging tiles, there's an old man that details where to find the proof Aleph needs to show that he is indeed the ancestor of Erdrick. It's something multiple villagers have mentioned across all the towns, and even the wizard in the southeast cave refuses to do anything for you without proof. It's the last artifact Aleph needs to create the Rainbow Bridge, but to find it, I need to travel to the spot that's 70 leagues south and 40 east of Tantagel Castle. And this right here is where Gwalyn's love comes into play. It's often said that rescuing Gwalyn is completely optional, and they're not wrong. If you know where to search for this proof, she can be completely ignored if you want. But on a first playthrough without using a guide, she is absolutely necessary. Besides, what hero wouldn't save the princess? Following her clues, I find Erdrick's token even further south and return to Hawksness. Wynn's spot is easy enough to discover, but it's guarded by a knight. More grinding might be necessary to defeat it, but Erdrick's armor is absolutely worth it. With every step, I now restore 1 HP and damage tiles no longer hurt. All that's left to do is to buy the flame sword and use the three artifacts with the southeast wizard to create the rainbow bridge. That's essentially the moment to moment story of Dragon Quest. The hero needs to become stronger and decipher all the villagers' clues to best prepare for the final battle against the Dragon Lord, as well as open the way to him. But even after all this, most players likely won't be strong enough to actually defeat him. His castle is by far the largest dungeon in the game with multiple paths, stairways, and the possibility of stumbling into an endless loop. However, there was a piece of advice long ago about a secret entrance in the Dragon Lord's throne room, and it's necessary to actually reach both him and the Hidden Sword of Erdrick. The final grinding session to challenge the Dragon Lord can take some time, as even if you do reach him, he is incredibly strong. He does massive damage and barely takes any from you. 
it is near essential to have as much MP as possible simply to maximize the amount of heal mores you can use. I made it a point to carry herbs with me to heal up right before the fight without having to use any more MP than necessary. Of course, this fails to mention something important about the Dragonlord, a choice that likely threw players for a loop back in 1986. The Dragonlord introduces himself, says he's been waiting for someone like you, and offers half the world to rule if you join him. Most players will likely refuse, as this villain has been the source of Alephgard's woes since the beginning. But what if you agree? Well, the Dragonlord is so surprised that he asks a second time before telling the hero to take a rest as he laughs maniacally and the screen turns red. Even more damning is how the game freezes, forcing the player to restart. There's no easy way to victory. What's great about this choice is how it was expanded upon in 2016's Dragon Quest Builders. There, the hero accepted the Dragonlord's proposal, leading Alephgard to fall into ruin. Now a builder must restore the continent and right the wrong committed by this fallen hero. I highly recommend it even if you're not typically a fan of Minecraft-like games as its story helps guide players rather than setting them loose with no direction. Nonetheless, Aleph has a Dragonlord to defeat and his first form is… just so dang cute. Look at that derpy face. It's appropriate too as this appearance is about as strong as any other monster in the dungeon. But upon defeating him, the Dragon Lord reveals his true form, and this is where it becomes challenging. First of all, the sprite is fantastic, menacing in a different way to the previous dragons Aleph has fought. Second, this thing is a beast that provides a genuine feeling of tension. It's a long road to get here, and dying means even more grinding to prepare. And I should know, as my attempts at level 19 and 20 both ended in failure. The amazing thing is, I didn't get any stronger against him. At best, I was doing 7 to 12 damage per turn, while he could easily do 40 plus. No, I learned the best times to heal and simply kept up the pressure as much as possible while ensuring he couldn't one-shot me. To see that final hit land is still satisfying to this day, which is amusing considering he only has 130 HP and takes about 2 minutes to defeat. An epic drawn out fight? This is not. What it leads to is a surprising epilogue where Aleph takes the Ball of Light, which banishes all the monsters from the world, and allows him to revisit any town to talk to its people. Unfortunately, there's only about two or three lines to actually see, so it's not that great of a victory lap on NES. But at least in Tantagel Castle, a row of knights flank the entryway with King Lorik at the end. There, he says that Aleph truly is the descendant of Erdrich, and it is his right to rule the land. He offers the crown, but Aleph actually speaks, saying that no, he would prefer to rule a land that he himself finds. Gwaelin arrives and begs to go with him on that journey. I agree, and the two leave the castle together, with the tale coming to an end, unless the dragons return again. A hearty congratulations later, and the credits roll. It's a classic adventure through and through, yet despite its legacy as a Japanese powerhouse, Dragon Quest didn't get off to a strong start upon release. In fact, it was so bad that it seemed Enix would lose money on the entire enterprise. However, Hori's articles on the game in Shonen Jump helped drum up interest as players discovered the pleasing Toriyama designs and the rich and exciting songs by Sugiyama. This grassroots effort and word of mouth shifted its fortunes dramatically as it reached 1 million units sold in the first six months and lifetime sales of 1.5 million units on the Famicom alone. By the time Famitsu's Game of the Year awards rolled around, it won Best Scenario, Best Character Design, Best Programmer, Best RPG, and Game of the Year. Dragon Quest wouldn't arrive in the West until 1989, where it also saw sluggish sales. Many saw the game as a relic as the genre had progressed quite a bit in the years since its release. But Nintendo took a direct interest in the Western release, as not only did a young Satoru Iwata help with developing the port, but copies were included in subscriptions to Nintendo Power. This helped boost sales of not only the game, but the magazine as well as suddenly this ad for Nintendo products was in thousands of more homes. In the end, it sold 500,000 copies in North America, making it the third best-selling game of the year and warranting the localizations of Dragon Quest 2 through 4. To this day, Dragon Quest is seen as a turning point in the RPG genre, as many of its elements set the standard for console RPGs to come. This ranged from making scenario writers more important, to the general look of an RPG, to romance playing some part in the adventure. While many of the design choices behind the game were due to the Famicom's limitations, they held true for many RPGs until the advent of 3D. One only has to look at a top-down perspective to realize that the game is likely an RPG. 
While Final Fantasy has become the more popular RPG in the West, it fundamentally built upon what Dragon Quest established. And with a game this popular, it's no surprise that it's seen ports and updates over the years. After the NES version, there was a Super Famicom port that not only improves the graphical quality, but decreases the amount of experience needed for levels, gives sprites to overworld monsters, removes the need for action commands, and makes the dungeons more unique. This was then ported to the Game Boy Color as a pair with Dragon Quest II, which did see a US release. Many of the names had to be changed, but it essentially plays the same as the Super Famicom version and includes an option to save on the field. Finally, there's the mobile version, which is also based on the Super Famicom port, except it uses an updated script that brings back the old English localization. This served as the basis for the Switch port, which uses a smoothing filter that is serviceable but loses some of the charm. Out of all these choices, I would recommend the mobile version to newcomers. Not only does it have the quality of life improvements of previous ports, but the constant grind is perfect for mobile. When I played this version, I mainly played it while waiting for appointments or generally goofing off. Grinding in these moments felt short and fulfilling as I was at least making some progress. Plus, it's generally pretty cheap. But even on the NES, it's impressive how well this game still holds up. The quest is simple to follow as long as you keep track of the clues, the combat is simple yet engaging, and the monster designs are as strong as ever. Dragon Quest is a perfectly playable RPG, if you don't mind the constant grind, though make no mistake, 80% of my gameplay was grinding for either levels or money. But the game does a great job of making it fun through most of the adventure thanks to constant goals. When that constant is lost, then the game becomes mostly a chore, which unfortunately is about the last 3 or 4 hours before reaching the final dungeon. That said, I still think it's worth playing for any RPG fan as long as you know what you're getting yourself into. And at this point, Yuji Horii, Koichi Nakamura, and Enix had a genuine hit on their hands. Now they just had to follow it up. And that was indeed the plan with that little seed of future stories that could perhaps be told in a sequel. Work had already begun, but does it recapture the magic while expanding on the core idea? I'll be finding out myself as I play Dragon Quest II on the NES for the very first time. Look forward to that in the future. But in the meantime, tell me your memories of Dragon Quest, whether it's the first game or the series as a whole. Thanks for watching, and as always, please consider subscribing to Good Vibes Gaming, hitting the like button, and ringing that bell. We also have a Patreon at patreon.com gvgaming with plenty of extra perks. Until next time, bye.